Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar this morning. We're going to pause just a moment while everyone's computers come online. Okay, great. I'm going to go ahead and get started with our introductions today. I'm Chelsea Simpson with the National Farm to School Network. Welcome to our Lunch Bites webinar series. Our webinars are always on the second Tuesday of every month at 12 p.m. Central Standard Time. Our webinar presentations are just 20 minutes usually uh, and followed by a short Q&A session. However, today's webinar will be a full hour um, with a uh, Q&A session included. If you have any questions at any point during today's webinar, you can type them into the window on your control panel, and um, we will get to them at the end of the webinar. I'll be moderating, um, moderating those questions to our panelists today. If you have suggestions for future webinars or general questions about Farm to School, you can send an email to me at chelsea at farmtoschool.org. That address will appear at the end of the webinar as well. Um, today's webinar is Food, Farm, and Nutrition Curriculum Connections, Developing Educational Experiences that Meet Teacher Needs. And I want to thank you all for attending today. Um, this is really a great community, and this is actually our, our largest registration um, for any of our webinars so far. So congrats to all of you in farm-based education. Uh, we want to get a little feel for who's on the line today. So if you'll bear with me, I'm going to ask you a couple uh, quick polls using our, our webinar system. And hold on just one second here. The polling is progress. We'll just wait a second while everyone answers. Okay, um, great. It looks like about half of you are beginners today. Um, here we go. Here we go. And we have one other poll question related to your, your work with um, farm-based education. Just one second. Bear with me. And this one's just related to um, what sort of work you do within farm-based education. This is just going to help our panelists today tailor their conversation with you. Okay, so it looks like most of you, the slight majority, work with the Farm to School program through a nonprofit or government agency. Okay, thanks for bearing with us while we had a, got an idea of, of who we had on the line. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to our first panelist today, Emily Hoyer, and um, we'll get this started. Take it away, Emily. Okay. Thanks, Chelsea. All right. So welcome to the webinar. My name is Emily Hoyler, and I work at Shelburne Farms um, as the curriculum specialist. And um, Shelburne Farms is a 1,400-acre working farm and National Historic Site and nonprofit agricultural and environmental education center in Vermont. Let me get to my slides here. So um, this webinar has been brought to you today by um, a coordination of the National Farm to School Network, Shelburne Farms, and the Farm-Based Education Association. And I want to encourage you to visit the partner websites and join the Farm to School and the Farm-Based Education Association networks. Both networks are free to join and have a lot of fantastic resources and opportunities that can strengthen and support you in your work. Um, I also wanted to extend an invitation to attend the ABCs of Farm-Based Education, which is a professional development training workshop for farmers and educators 
which will be held here at Shelburne Farms um, in Vermont October 21st through 23rd. And you can visit the Shelburne Farms or the um, FBEA websites to learn more about that. And the last um, little announcement is October is National Farm to School Month. And there's uh, many things you can do to participate and celebrate um, all the connections that are happening all over the country between schools and local food. So again, um, if you visit the National Farm to School website, you can learn more about that. So just wanted to go over the goals of today's webinar. Um, so the first thing is to provide some tools and ideas for designing food farm and nutrition education curriculum that meets the needs of classroom teachers. So I'm going to start off by describing one approach to designing curriculum um, and learning experiences that meet standards and classroom needs. And then I'll turn it over to three educators in the field to share their stories and examples. So first we'll hear from Tom Sabo, who's a high school biology teacher at Montpelier High School and also the founder of the Center for Sustainable Systems in Montpelier, Vermont. Then we'll hear from Bob Dillon, who's the uh, middle school principal at the Maplewood Richmond Heights School in St. Louis, Missouri. And finally, we'll hear from Alice Freilich, who's the education director at Zanger Farm in Portland, Oregon. And we'll leave some time for questions at the end. So let's get started. Um, I wanted to begin by sharing with you the curriculum design philosophy that guides my work here at Shelburne Farms. And it's called Backwards Design. And it's based on the work of Grant Wiggins and Jay McTie, who are um, big names in the field. But um, a lot of times when we design curriculum, based, it's based on this really fun, cool activity, this idea we have for something that students will really like to do. And those sparks of inspiration are really great, but the next question you need to ask yourself is why? What is it? that students are going to learn from this. So if you think about the goals and objectives of our curriculum first, we're, we're engaging in backwards design. And to give you a little more context about our work at Shelburne Farms, um, we focus on education for sustainability. And this graphic shows our framework. So all of our education programming, including the food, farm, and nutrition curriculum that we develop, is aimed at um, helping students know that interconnected nature of the human and national communities that they're part of, as well as engaging them in projects that will allow them to make a difference in the community. And the end goal is really cultivating citizens who are engaged in creating sustainable communities. So that's really our big goal of all of our work. But um, sustainability is a really big concept. So one way to approach it is by identifying the essential components, or what we call the big ideas of sustainability. And we've identified several of them. Um, but And the ones that we have on this list, this is a partial list. Uh, there are more on the Sustainable Schools Project website. Um, but these big ideas are the ones that we've found are most accessible to K-12 teachers. And they're already embedded in existing standards and curriculum but you're not limited to this list. You can definitely come up with your own big ideas. It's the idea of using a big idea that's what's important. Uh, so a tool that I wanted to share with you today is this snapshot tool. Um, and it's also available on the Sustainable Schools Project website. And it can be used by anyone who's designing an educational experience for students, whether you're a teacher, a farmer, a nonprofit educator, and you can use this process, this backwards design, to create a whole unit or to create a single farm-based field trip or a garden experience. Um, but because you're engaging in this backwards design process, you're going to be really clear about the goals of the experience, and that way it's really easily connected to the classroom. So what I'm going to do is take you through the three stages of the tool briefly, and I'm also going to do a slight detour to talk about standards and the common core. But first, we'll start with this top box, which is stage one, the desired results. So in the backwards design process, the first thing you want to identify is the outcome or the results of the experience or the unit. So you want to think about the big ideas, the goals, which includes the learning standards that you're going to assess, and your food farm or nutrition connections and content. So if you think about it like planning a trip, you first decide where it is you want to go, and after you know where you want to go, then you decide how you're going to get there. 
so this next slide um, defines some of the terms that I'm using here. So big ideas and enduring understandings are things that are true both in the example of this educational experience on the farm or in the garden, but they're also true in the world in general. So if students get it, they're going to be able to reapply what they've learned to a new situation. And this is what is called transfer, and it's a goal of education. We want kids to understand something and then be able to reapply what they've learned in a new situation kind of independently. Um, essential questions are tools that you can use to help students think critically and really focus in on the big ideas and enduring understandings. They're really open-ended questions, and they don't have one answer, and they really get students thinking and engaged in discussion. So that same cool activity that gave you the idea for wanting to design some curriculum for farm to school um, can be framed in different ways and get at different big ideas or enduring understandings. And I'm going to show you two examples of what I mean by that. So many of you are probably familiar with the Three Sisters Garden, which is a companion planting of squash, beans, and corn. It's often associated with Native American cultures. Um, corn is planted in, the, in a mound of earth, and then you plant beans around the corn. The beans use the corn as a trellis, and then squash, pumpkins, whatever are planted um, around that. That traps moisture, it provides shade, keeps the weeds out, and the bean roots also provide nutrients for the squash and the corn. So one way you could frame the Three Sisters Garden is to focus on the big idea of interdependence, and you could explore how the three crops work together, how they depend on one another to flourish. Each species kind of plays a different role in working towards the same successful outcome. And you could also extend interdependence to focus on humans and nature and how the plants are cultivated by people and are therefore nurtured and receive preferential treatment over other plants. And then how people are also dependent on the crops for survival and they've developed this method of planting um, to achieve the best results. And that really kind of is a big focus on interdependence. But you can also take the very same Three Sisters Garden and look at a different big idea, say cycles. So when planting the garden, um, first you plant the corn, and then you wait a few weeks until it's about six inches tall. Then you plant the beans and squash. So students could be learning about plant life cycles and different stages. They could be involved in preparing the garden. They could um, journal and record the growth of their plants weekly. They could predict what they anticipate seeing next. You know, there's lots of different connections that can be made to seasonal cycles, growing seasons, harvesting seasons. So the big point here is that you can do pretty much anything as your activity or learning experience, but what's important is to be clear on how you want to frame it. So if you identify the big idea, the enduring understandings, and essential questions, you can be really intentional in promoting learning and helping students make connections. So I'm going to do our little detour into standards now. Um, standards are written expectations about what students should know and be able to do, and most states have written their own set of standards. But you might have heard of the Common Core State Standards, and they're a new state-led initiative to establish some common expectations around math and literacy nationwide. And all but five U.S. states are going to be using them. And at the address listed on this slide, you can view the standards um, in their full version. But they cover English language arts, so reading, writing, communication skills. Um, there's a new emphasis on helping students really develop communication, collaboration, and presentation skills. And what's great about this focus is that it's a good match for project-based learning, which is a great match for food, farm, and nutrition education. Similarly, the math focuses on the numeracy covered at each grade level, but food, farm, and nutrition education can provide opportunities for applied math like measurement, geometry, data, and statistics. Another set of standards that you should know about are the Next Generation Science Standards, and they've also been developed in a similar state-led initiative um, to address science practices and content, and they're divided into three areas. The practices section, which is really focusing on inquiry, the cross-cutting themes, and the disciplines. And if you notice the cross-cutting themes, these are big ideas, so it's a really great fit for this backwards design process. 
Um, so you can think of the Common Core as providing some of the framework for the skills students need and the Next Generation Science Standards or your local state standards as providing some of the content framework and then the food farmer nutrition educational experiences that you're creating are really providing the context for students to gain this understanding and these skills. So to return to the snapshot tool um, and the backwards design process, once you've identified your goals, where you want to go, your big ideas, enduring understandings, essential questions, um, you move on to the next box, which is stage two, the evidence. And this is really where you start to think about assessment. How are you going to know if you've met your goals? How are you going to know if the students get it? And if this is a farm-based experience, you might plan to close um, your day with a discussion that can be used to gauge student learning or provide follow-up opportunities for a classroom. So if you have an essential question, like how are people in farms connected, you could use that question and have students kind of reflect and offer what they learned throughout the day based on the experience they've had. Um, if you have time for an extended course of study and you're going to be seeing students for a longer period, um, you can engage them in a project through which they can both learn and demonstrate their learning. And that can serve as both instruction and assessment. So one resource I just wanted to share quickly, um, for if you're interested to learn more about project-based learning, I really recommend the Buck Institute for Education. I use their resources all the time in my work. Um, they have a really great handbook for project development and design that you can buy, but on their website they also have a lot of free downloads, including planning tools for educators, rubrics for assessing students, um, for students to both assess themselves and for a teacher to assess them. So definitely check out their work. So finally, back to the snapshot tool, um, the final thing that you think about is the learning plan. So to return to that analogy I made earlier about the trip, once you know where you're going and how you'll know when you get there, then you can plan the stops you want to make along the way. So this is where you get back to the really cool activity that you thought of. Um, that sparked the whole planning of this experience. And now you can figure out how that experience as well as the sequence of other experiences you need to provide for students so that they can achieve the goals that you've set out for them. Um, and what I love about the backwards design process is that it really helps us be intentional and clear about what we're doing and why we're doing it. So the big point that I want to reiterate is that the sky is really the limit when you're designing food farm or nutrition education. What's really important to keep in mind is how you frame it. Um, and so by identifying um, the big idea, enduring understandings, and essential questions, you can be really intentional in promoting learning and helping students make connections and transferring their understanding to new situations. So to wrap up my part, um, this is my contact info. Please feel free to email me with questions or ideas. Um, there's some other resources listed here that I mentioned during my presentation, um, but I'm not going to spend too much more time here. I'm going to send it, turn it over to Tom Sabo, who's a high school biology teacher and the founder of the Center for Sustainable Systems. Great. Thank you, Emily. A little volume check here. The bars look good. I'm going to go for it. So the picture that you see in front of you is um, the greenhouse and, and some of the gardens in the back of Montpelier High School in Montpelier, Vermont. And this has served as an outdoor classroom for a number of years. We built it back in 2004 as a way to uh, get at teaching about sustainability. Uh, as was said earlier, using the food system as, as a means to teach these larger concepts, what you're really providing is a context to get at the things that you're already teaching. One second. I'm trying to switch the slide. There we go. Bear with me, folks. All right, so I'm just going to take a couple minutes here and kind of go through some of the rationale for, for incorporating food system education into your curriculum. Now, I saw the results of the poll, and there looks like about 5% of actual classroom teachers 
um, and I'm not sure how many of you are actually at the high school level, but I think um, what I'm going to get at here will be benefit to everyone because uh, all of you are involved in education, so you're working with teachers. And the same things that make this type of education valuable at the, at the lower grades or in the periphery at the high school level, the same basic qualities also make it valuable for your mainstream high school students. So a goal for all teachers is student engagement. And the key to student engagement is making your curriculum relevant and rigorous. And there's different ways to do that, but food system education is a fantastic vehicle for that. For starters, everyone eats. There's you know a big step up for relevance. And the complexity of the food system really allows for, for rigorous uh, lessons and units. Now, anyone who's worked with kids, I think we'll, one second, I'm having some control issues, and we're back here. I think they, anecdotally, they will recognize the importance of, of relevance and rigor in student engagement, but there's also studies that back, back that up. There's a famous one here, I cite it on the bottom of the screen, by the International Center for Leadership and Education, large study, five-year study, 10 states, and the, the new three R's of education are relevance, rigor, and relationships. Now, the relationship between the student and the teacher, you know, that moves beyond the, the content, but when they're engaged, when they're, they're getting what you're teaching, when they're excited about it, it makes the relationship piece a lot easier. Here's just a, a little bit of a framework, a tool that I've, that I've borrowed from the source that you can see on the bottom of the screen. Uh, I work with a number of teachers at my school in Montpelier, but also in surrounding um, high schools in central Vermont. And this is one of the tools that we use to um, develop curriculum to really uh, increase the chances that we are working at the high level of rigor and relevance. What we're doing here is called service learning. And there are basic tenets that uh, quality service learning projects all share. And one is that it's actual meaningful service. And this really lends itself to the relevance as well. Kids understand um, why you're doing what you're doing, and they learn in the process. So we're growing food. We're growing food uh, that's being served in the school's cafeteria. And in Vermont, we have a severe need for season extension. So that's why we constructed the greenhouse. Here's an image, as you can see, March 15th, 2011, lots of snow. So uh, we grow salad greens pretty much throughout the entire school year inside the greenhouse. All right, and I double clicked. Here we go. Another. Um, important piece for quali high quality service learning projects is the curricular connection. This is absolutely key, otherwise it's just community service. And I don't mean to say just because there's, there's clearly value in that, but there's lots of um, learning opportunities uh, in service and if you really design them, you can get the most out of it. Here's an example of uh, some of the books that we read in my environmental science class. I will do a reading per week. We'll discuss them on Friday, usually around a dish of food we prepare from our garden. And it provides um, a connection with what we are studying and what we're working on to these larger national and global issues. All three of these are great books if you're not familiar with them. All right, why incorporate food system education? It can be easily taught across the curriculum. We use this as a, as a thread uh, to make these cross-disciplinary connections. Now, at the lower grades, um, integrated education is very, very common. But as you move through middle school, and certainly by the time you get to high school, we teach things in these fragmented, um, you know, little isolated boxes, not making the connections for, for any of the kids. And that obviously makes it challenging for kids to, uh, to understand how things are related and to see the big picture. Now the food system provides this umbrella that enables you to really make these connections across the uh, curriculum. And I'm going to show you an example of some of the things that we've done. All right. Okay. So 
This is just a Montpelier High School, uh, some of the different classes that have tied into food production. The business class wrote that business plan that's pictured there on the side. Art class is, is constantly, uh, you know, making sculptures and paintings. I have a closet full of beautiful greenhouse watercolors that I should probably put on eBay. Environmental science, you'll see more of um, the physics class. I'm going to show you some slides. They did this great energy study and constructed some solar panels. Health class used to study the... Uh, the paper pyramid. Now they're working with Whole Foods that we grew in the garden, doing recipes, tests, and taste tests. Spanish classes have an example coming up. They're really tying a lot to the, the Spanish program. Um, social studies and, and economics are great, great uh, subjects to explore with the food system. All right, the solar panels I mentioned. Uh, we were going to put an irrigation system into the greenhouse and wanted to uh, find an alternative energy source to power the water pump. We didn't want to add to our footprint because the whole idea of this greenhouse, or part of the idea, was, was to lessen our ecological footprint. So I approached the physics teacher and she just really ran with it and did an, an entire alternative energy feasibility study um, examining the site with her students, considering biomass, microhydro, wind, even a little stationary bike where students would ride the bike to generate electricity for anything for, for gym points to detention. It got a, got a little uh, out of whack there. They ended up um, deciding that solar energy was the best for our site. They studied it further. They wrote grants and then worked with a, a local solar energy company and installed that 2.64 kilowatt system you can see on top of the greenhouse. We only need about two or three of those panels to meet our electric needs. So the rest of it's grid tied so the school actually um, absorbs our production. So we are an energy producer for the school. Okay, it's experiential. Now science teachers and, and teachers at, at lower grades, um, they, they get the whole hands-on thing and this, the subjects really lend itself to that. But once you get to the high school, once again, you're in a social studies class, you're in an economics class, uh, often teachers are struggling to, to find a way to make it experien experiential and working with the food system is a great way to do that. For example, here are students in my environmental class, once again, uh, constructing broad forks. Uh, this is an Elliott Coleman design device to aerate the soil without tilling it, because we practice no-till agriculture at Montpelier High School. So while they're studying soil structure and they're studying you know, the problems with uh, you know, breaking up the structure and the fossil fuels associated with that, they're learning how to weld. Here's that irrigation system I mentioned earlier. These are copper pipes that were uh, soldered or sweated, as they say, in the field by students. They designed this entire system. I'm waiting for the slide to change. There you go. It delivers water. It's a sub-irrigation system. It delivers water to the, the soil, so the, the roots take it up, keeps the leaves dry. That water gets cycled back. It's actually rainwater that we collect as well. Um, and it drains into those gutters and then it's pumped back into this tank with a pump that was uh, is powered by the solar panels. Those okay, why else? This is the rationale, right, for using food system education. We talked about how it's such a good way to teach relevant, rigorous, experiential. Well, it's also important stuff to teach. I imagine people on this webinar kind of get that already. Uh, the average food mile, right, the uh, 1,500 miles from farm to plate, it's a stat everyone at Montpelier High School knows, um, as well as all the pollution associated with that, the emissions, the packaging. I think part of the uh, another problem with this great divide between where food is produced to consumed is we have this disconnect and people aren't really willing to pay the price, the fair price for food because they really have no idea how it's produced. And one of the consequences of that is some of the, you know, the egregious exploitation of some of our, our migrant workers, you know, whether it's, you know, out in the Midwest at its slaughterhouses or down in the tomato fields in Florida. And of course, the health consequences, the original grants that we got for the greenhouse, a lot of them were nutritional grants um, based on, you know, the rise in teen obesity and type 2 diabetes. All right. I just... For time reasons, I'm going to fly past that slide I accidentally forwarded through. Here is the uh, the greenhouse at 7.45 a.m. Biology students operate the greenhouse. They grow salad greens. 
about 150 feet from our cafeteria door. Those, um, they harvest them before school, and then during class they end up studying them. They study the stomata and the you know, underside of the leaves. They study the root structure, germination in the seeds, uh, soil chemistry, nutrient cycles, pest cycles when the aphids show up. They have a little aphid party when the aphids show up. There we go. Here's a, the original potato patch, 15 feet, just 15 feet from the cafeteria door. Lots of people said, no, you can't grow it there. The soil's nasty and compacted. We just threw down a bunch of compost, about eight inches of compost. Let it sit on the side, turned it in, and then we yielded 800 pounds of potatoes. This is, this is some of the earlier pictures. The gardens surround the greenhouse now. We grow onions. Each year we added some crops, and each year we had the students kind of figure out what crops they wanted to grow. You know, they would throw out things like bananas, and we realize why that won't work, and they uh, consider our, our limitations, and we grow things like onions and leeks and garlic and squash. We save seeds from squash. We're up to about fourth or fifth generation now of butternut squash, black beans. There we go save those as well, just harvest those today. We do a little work in the kitchen. And one of the benefits of, of having lots of different classes uh, use the food system as, as a tool is we can kind of spread the work, the additional work that's needed. So one kid, one class isn't getting hit too hard. There's a lot to learn scrubbing potatoes, but only up to a point. And parents certainly would, uh, in this community, get upset if their kids were scrubbing potatoes every week. So it's a once a semester event you know, per class. Uh, that's one of the hurdles, one of the limitations of working with Whole Foods is I show up with 800 pounds of, of potatoes and I say, hey, they're free. And, and the food service director looks at a bunch of dirty potatoes and, and sees a big labor expense. The community seed library is one of these um, outgrowths of, of some of the service learning work. Once we started saving seeds, kids were studying the you know, threats to our food security due to the loss of, of seed diversity. And now we collect seeds in our region where we document the stories, help um, disseminate them, and then help uh, collect them back in the fall. I forgot to set my timer. All right, beyond the projects. So, you know, it's the thread that connects the dots between units within a discipline, right? But also between the disciplines themselves. And To that end, I spent last year on a Whirlwind Foundation Fellowship and Sabbatical trying to expand the reach and the benefits of the work we've been doing at Montpelier High School and created this, the Center for Sustainable Systems. Um, this enables us to, to work to further the reach across the curriculum at Montpelier High School, right, connect those dots, but also work with teachers at other area schools and create year-round programming. We now have summer programming that offers academic credit as well as um, pay for students. Task Streams, one more resource that we use at the Center for Sustainable Systems. Uh, this enables us to, to um, have a level of accountability for the teachers that we're working with. If you, this is only a screenshot, so we can't really scroll through it, but here's an example of a Spanish unit They're using maize. We're growing a variety of corn right now, which we'll harvest in about two weeks, where AP Spanish students will, will grow it, harvest it, process it into flour and make tortilla in a traditional um, fashion while learning the language of the folks who cultivated that crop. And one more. There we go. So summary slide, this is a really good way to teach, right, stuff we're already teaching. The research supports it, anecdotally it's supported, and it's also important stuff to teach. Uh, can, right, from a sustainability perspective, it considers that social, eco ec ecological, and economic needs, um, and it considers those of the present generation as well as the future generation. And ultimately, we're cultivating uh, informed consumers and active citizens. I believe that was my last slide. Thanks, Tom. Uh, right. That seems to have me working okay. Um, now it looks like I'm running the slides. You know, if you have not been to Shelburne Farms, one of the most beautiful places in the world, I'm jealous that Emily gets to work there every day. And 
I am, uh, would love to move to Montpelier uh, to have my kids at your school. That's fantastic. Uh, hi there, I'm Bob Dillon, the principal of Maplewood Richmond Heights Middle School. Um, we are a um, small, about 150 student school in St. Louis, Missouri. One of the differences between Montpelier and us um, is that we exist in an urban area, uh, very much so. Uh, I'm always jealous of the land space I see in all of Tom's slides. Um, we are landlocked and we use every nook and cranny of our property to try to do this work. Uh, we are very excited that we've been able to work with our local farmers over time. We've been able to grow things here on site. Uh, and We've been able to do a number of projects that I wanted to share with you today as just both inspiration and um, just continuing everyone's thinking around how to connect food and farm and nutrition. Uh, there's our school. Um, like I said, we've been on about a 10-year journey in what we call building urban sustainability. All of our projects fit uh, with what Emily was talking about in regards to backwards design. We think about with the end in mind. We think about the big picture and essential questions and the ideas that um, you know we really want kids to know and learn deeply. Uh, attached to the end of my slides are some of the essential questions and enduring understandings that we use as a part of our uh, work that we're doing. We believe that, you know, we hear a lot of talk around the country about the achievement gap, but we feel as though we can fill um, the experience gap for a lot of kids, and that will be the bridge to the achievement gap, and so I think that that's another reason why we do this work. Uh, these are some of our students in Milwaukee. Uh, we took a trip from St. Louis to Milwaukee to visit the Urban Ecology Center in Milwaukee. And, you know, we're dealing with students that uh, a lot of them live in poverty. About 52% of our kids live in poverty. Uh, many of them believe that food comes in packages and gets cooked in microwaves. Uh, many of them haven't been out of the city. And so we go out of our way to give kids lots and lots of experience so they can not only achieve academically when they get to college, but they can achieve uh, in the cultural landscape that also is college. We really believe uh, in what we call the arc of sustainability. So we believe oftentimes some of these projects we start are novel. Someone has an idea, they say, hey, this would be great if we try this. And we allow that to happen here. We allow folks to fail forward. We allow folks to see uh, the power of ideas coming to shape. And then what we do is once we reach past that novel stage, we go to a place where people are thinking, where does this fit deeply into our curriculum? Where does this go deeply into the things that we want kids to know and enjoy? And then the third part of that for us is really about building community partnership. Uh, what you see there in front of you is the first harvest of our aquaponics tank. Uh, we have fish uh, that are helping to um, feed uh, our, our grow bed that you're looking at there. And uh, we serve that lettuce the next day in our cafeteria. Uh, there's probably people saying, you can't do that, and we just find ways to do that. And so uh, I actually need to go over this afternoon and harvest just about the same amount of lettuce. Um, and we're only growing at about 30% capacity right now. We have about 150 to 200 bluegill that uh, are native species here in Missouri that are helping to fuel and give us the nutrients for our lettuce. And uh, we're excited about the data collection that kids are doing around that and just also learning how things work as systems. We spend a lot of time talking about systems thinking here also. We have about 100,000 honeybees here on campus. You're looking at our top bar hive that just went in last year. And one of our students uh, that really loves the bees standing there holding the top bar hive. Uh, our bee story is probably our most successful piece about how we've deeply ingrained sustainable practices and sustainable thinking of our students. Our students have been able to say, wow, we have bees. And then to realize that bees can be about science, and bees can be about economics, and bees can be about entrepreneurship. And just as Tom was talking about all the different curricular areas thing can, things can fall into, what our students do, we produce about 15 gallons of honey here on campus every year. Students sell that. We make lip balm. We make soap. But kids get to see that you can really take something directly from the bees and plop it right into our community. And now we're selling that at our farmer's market also. And so in an urban area with farmer's market and food deserts, uh, it's really exciting for kids to be able to think about food and water and energy and all of those other problems that we're going to be affected by for the next 50 years. And our kids are touching that every day. 
One of the other projects we think about, uh, we like to think about the social, economic, and environmental justice impacts of a lot of the work we do. You're looking at a partnership between our students and an architecture firm here in town. Pruitt Igo is a, um, some of you may or may not know, it was the largest federal housing project in the United States in the 50s. It was torn down in 1970s, and that site has set fallow for the last 30 years. It's really an urban forest. And our students were a part of a design competition to say, how can we resurrect that space? And so think about all the different types of issues that kids can tangle with. You know, how do you preserve the past? How do you make sure that the future, how do you get people to respect the land? Um, it was an incredible project with incredible partnership. But these are the kind of things that as you start to lay the groundwork, uh, do the work with the standards and understand those at a deep level. These are the types of projects that can emerge and I'm really proud of the students and, uh, and the staff for the work around these. Tom mentioned project-based learning. Emily mentioned project-based learning. I like to talk about passion-based learning. Uh, just look at those kids' faces. This was our kickoff to our aquaponics project. And those kids are seeing how you can grow uh, fish and lettuce in a symbiotic system. Uh, one of the students the other day said, you know, I still have one of those fish. And you could see the look on her eyes. And that student right there is just uh, trying to figure out how it all works. But we really, really want to ignite uh, passion and learning in kids. I think too often we exhaust that by keeping kids in the classroom. Another pig, a big part of what we do is we get kids outside. And experiential learning is a big part of what we do even beyond the work that we do um, when it comes to our gardens and our bees and our fish. This is one of our science teachers with Ron Berger. Uh, Ron Berger has inspired a lot of the work here at Maplewood Richmond Heights Middle School. Uh, you know, we're excited about the Common Core standards. We believe that the Common Core in and of itself calls for interdisciplinary real world work. And that happens at elementary schools much better than it happens at middle schools and high schools. But we are really trying to cross over subject areas for kids to get real experiences. And um, Ron's book, The Culture, Culture of Excellence, uh, really talks about b kids being craftsmen and doing iterative work where they work on drafts and projects over time until they're excellent. And we feel like that in and of itself is a sustainable practice that we're continuing to work on something and make it better and make it better until it's where it is. And building that type of work ethic in kids is it's also making it um, very exciting for um, the other work we're doing. There's our garden. Uh, you can see there's our garden. Tom has this beautiful forest in his background, and I have the city library across the street. And one of my final thoughts is that we have really gone out of our way to think of lunch as an academic period. We have thought about lunch as a space for kids to learn about new foods, about ways to put foods together, to try new things. And too often we find that schools are trying to make lunch a zero-sum game where it costs zero cents to make lunch every day. And we really, really believe that we don't ask any other academic period and at all to be cost neutral. No one asks the social studies department not to spend any money or to raise their own money so we can teach history. We believe that all of this work around nutrition and education uh, has to be uh, something that schools put money into because it is worth doing. So that's a big part of what we do. And we're able to serve some fantastic lunches. Finally, uh, these are my resources, and so uh, give those a look when you get a chance. Our website, our YouTube channel, and also some of the other big picture stuff and essential questions we're doing. With that, I'm going to turn things over to Alice. Uh, thank you all for being here, and thanks for listening. Thanks, Bob. Um, thanks for having me. Um, my name's Alice. I work at a little farm in Portland, Oregon. We're within the city limits of Portland. We are a nonprofit organization. Um, so I'm going to take just a little bit of time to explain kind of what we do and how we partner with schools and teachers directly. Um, this is an aerial photo of our farm. Um, right in the city limits of Portland, we are on a 10 acre wetland and we farm about four acres of land. Um, you can see our neighbors are right next to us. Um, there's actually a warehouse in the back of that picture where the rows of crops are. Um, so we see about 5,000 students a year on the farm for our field trip programming. Um, so we have our on-site field trip programming. We go into classrooms. 
um, and teaching classrooms. And we also do a summer camp program on site. Um, in addition to the youth education stuff we do, we also run a farmer's market um, for local farmers. Um, we do educational classes for families and individuals um, in our neighborhood. Um, the neighborhood we're in is a really um, reduced or limited income neighborhood. Um, there's a lot of immigrants from all over the world in our neighborhood. Um, and we try to serve our neighborhood the best we can. So um, having a little trouble clicking to the next slide here. Um, there it is. OK. So um, the way we partner with, with teachers is mostly through our field trips and our in-classroom programming. So any teachers can come to us and say, we want to come on a field trip just one time. Um, we do have a fee for service for that. We ask for $3.50 per student. Um, and we do offer scholarships as well as bus scholarships. Um, and then our deeper partnership that we have is our farm school partnership. Um, the last few years, it's been called the Farmer in the Classroom program. We're just changing it this year because the program's evolved um, a little bit. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about that farm school partnership that we offer. Um, So um, the last school year was our third year of the partnership um, with the school district that we're in here, which is the David Douglas School District. We kind of border the Portland Public School District and the David Douglas School District. Um, David Douglas School District has, a, on average, 70% free and reduced lunch program students. Um, and we've been serving their teachers for a number of years. And um, we got to a point where we said, hey, we want to form a deeper relationship with you here in our neighborhood. This farm is a resource for you guys who live here. Let's figure out how we can form a deeper relationship. And it really just started with a handful of teachers that were interested and dedicated to bringing their students here um, a couple times a year. And that developed into this program where we were seeing um, about 400 students throughout the course of the school year, um, just fifth grade students. So they would come to the farm in the fall. Um, and that the topics of all of these programs um, really came about through conversations with teachers. So I would meet with all of the fifth grade team at a school, and they would say, you know, here's what our calendar year looks like. This is what we're teaching in each month. And I would say, great, this is how the farm can support that. So um, it was very teacher driven um, and also being really realistic to what we could offer um, and what our strengths were on the farm. So um, we developed a, a program where students came three times to the farm, and we visited their classroom three times. And these programs were science-based as well as social studies-based. So students would come for a farm tour and also do service learning. Uh, we would visit um, their classroom and do an ecology-based program surrounding worm bins. Um, and then we visit a couple more times and talk a lot about how food travels around the world and how food gets to them and what seasonal choices look like. Um, and then they'd come back to the farm in the spring. Um, and they had kind of their choice of which focus areas they wanted it to be, whether it was wetlands, soils, or plants. They would choose two of those. So that's what the partnership evolved into for last year's um, school year. Um, what happened during that school year is one of the teachers that we've been working with for a number of years switched schools. And the new school said, hey, why don't we get to do this? And then another school said, hey, why don't we get to do this? Um, and the district became involved. So um, the district actually came to us as a nonprofit and said, hey, we want, if this is what's best for the students, we want all of our fifth grade students to be able to partner with you. And we said, whoa. That's a lot of students. Um, it's uh, about 865 students. Um, and we are just a small farm. There's a staff of six people that work here. And we hire on seasonal people and interns. But that seems like a lot for us. And um, we decided that we wanted to be able to do it and be able to do it um, honoring the students and having the best possible um, experience for them. So we did come up with a partnership. Um, so next, this school year, starting now, um, we're focusing just on science with all 865 fifth graders. Um, they're going to be coming out to the farm starting next Monday. 
and we'll be um, focusing our fall trip on one of their fifth grade benchmarks in Oregon, which is climate and weather. So we'll, we're focusing and honing in all of our programs to really meet those science standards for the teachers. And um, the focus of those trips came about through a few meetings with um, teacher, individual teachers, and then also with kind of the science curriculum team for fifth grade in the David Douglas School District. So this is what our partnership looks like for this year. Um, they're going to be coming to the farm three times still. We've kind of cut out those social studies programs. Um, so we're just going to be doing our one winter classroom visit. Um, so um, this farm school programming is a really big partnership for our farm. And the way that we make it work as a nonprofit is um, we're, we are in search of grants to help support this program. It's going to take a lot of um, staff time and volunteer time. Um, the district is supporting us a little bit financially, but it's, uh, you know, like I said previously, it's a kind of strapped district financially. So, um, so we're making it work. Um, I think it'll be awesome. I'm really excited. Um, and we get a lot of support from our community. So um, that's kind of what our partnership looks like this year. Um, and so um, there's a couple resources for you all out there. One of our programs that deals with food miles um, can be accessed on the Sustainable Schools Project site. Um, I referenced the agriculture in the classroom curriculum um, based out of Wisconsin. There's multiple states that's based out, but the Wisconsin one seems pretty helpful. Um, a local school here in Portland um, does a lot of on on-site stuff connecting their gardens and their cafeteria. So that website there is Eat, Think, Grow. That's a really helpful resource um, for lessons and ideas about seasonal education. Um, and I reference state benchmark standards and talk to teachers directly. So I think the biggest thing for us in developing curriculum that supports teachers is talking to teachers. And, identifying teachers that already are interested in the work you do and seeing how you can support them and, and, and going from there. How would this help other teachers who maybe wouldn't, wouldn't think to come to the farm? But you're, if you have teachers you're working with directly, ask them how you can support them better. And keep in mind that is your goal, the, the student's health and the student education is the goal of, of your program. So um, and our website is on there as well, sangerfarm.org. So I kind of pushed through that so we would save some time for questions. Thank you so much, Alice and everyone else. That was a fantastic presentation. We're gonna we are gonna move on to questions now. Um, I know everyone has a few. Everyone's been asking them throughout the webinar. Whoops. Here we go. And um, but if you haven't asked a question yet, go ahead and type it in. I'll be moderating this section. Uh, the most popular question we always get during our webinars is, will this be recorded and shared somewhere? And the answer is yes, if you visit um, farmtoschool.org, uh, which is the website of the National Farm to School Network. We have a webinar page, and our past webinars are all recorded there. Um, it takes a while to load, and it will take an extra, uh, extra time for this one to load since it's longer than our usual webinars, so be patient. But that should be up in a week or so. And um, but I'll turn now to the other questions. Oh, and I will add also that we have a section there where we upload um, the slides from this webinar as a PDF for download. And we will also be uploading um, additional resources that the presenters today have uh, prepared as a downloadable PDF as well. So one of the first questions I'm seeing here is um, some folks are wondering uh, if uh, any of our panelists today can talk about how uh, the curriculum standards that you referenced uh, would apply in uh, locations outside the U.S., and I'm not sure if this is something that you can speak to or not, but specifically in the U.K. and Canada, how applicable are the lessons you've talked about today? Um, I'll, this is Emily, and I'll take a stab at that. I'm not familiar with um, curriculum standards outside the U.S., but I do believe that if you use the backwards design and focus on these big ideas, these are really truths about the world. And so I think it would be relevant and connected to curriculum in other places. Um, that's just my 
guess, um, but I'd be curious if anyone else knows more about this. Yeah. I would just say, Emily, that I think that um, there's a piece about asking kids questions. And anytime you can build curricular things around asking questions, um, I think you get deeper understanding. So um, using essential questions has been a key for us. And I can't imagine that's just not just best practice everywhere. Um, this is Alice here. And we work with a lot of students from all around the world. And I think one of the universal things that connects people to learning, connects people to a healthier life is actually getting outside and making those personal connections to land and living things. So those are kind of like um, Bob and Emily were saying are universal things that um, I know teachers talk to me about how students can go through experiences and then reference those experiences to learn upon. So um, I think that that farm-based education is applicable in a lot of, in a lot of the world. Thank you. That's great. Uh, Tom, quick question for you. How big is your school? I'm sorry, that was for me? Uh-huh. Uh, my school is 360 students, and it is the public high school for the capital of Vermont. Wow. Small. We're the only, <laughs> only state capital without a McDonald's. Yeah. Oh, it's just outside the city limits, Tom. That's such yeah, a... Yeah, you know, <laughs> central Vermont. Very good. My kids go there all the time. Not my children, but my students. So here's a question um, about dealing with students, specifically older students, high school and middle school. But one of our attendees says that they have a problem when students come to the farm because they've already learned quite a bit, um, amazingly, about, about agriculture. And they have ideas about how things on the farm should be happening with regards to permaculture and sustainability. And um, sometimes there's an ad attitude adjustment that needs to happen to get them to really listen. I'm wondering if any of you can speak to um, dealing with those sort of personality conflicts with um, with really getting um, older young people to tune in. I'd like to take a stab at that. Um, as a high school teacher, I, I experienced that all the time. Um, here's a quick anecdote. Just this past spring, I brought uh, five different classes from two high schools to a local farm where we leased land, and we were planting potatoes. They happened to be you know, heirloom potatoes that were tied into a bunch of different types of curriculum. One student said to me, you know, we did this in third grade and fifth grade and seventh grade. And I said, well, yeah, that's good because, you know, we do all the important stuff every year, just like math, right? But I think what the, the important piece here falls to the teacher. So we need to have grade level appropriate lessons built around these. Otherwise, if you're just repeating what was done in those earlier grades, kids rightfully check out. Now, this isn't a fault of the topic because the food system is so complex. This really comes down to you know, teachers either not having the, the background, the experience, or the time to create those, those really rigorous lessons around the topic of the food system. That's a great answer. Thank you. Um, one of our attendees is a farmer, and she says these are great programs, but not farms. And she hasn't seen a lot of farms in farm to school, which I'll speak to that a little bit. When we when we talk about education topics, uh, particularly when we get panelists for webinars, they do tend to be panelists who are working um, uh, on, you know, not necessarily farms that are farms for farm sake, but they're farms for education sake, I guess would be one way to put it. But um, uh, there are definitely lots and lots of uh, working farms in, in farm to school programs. Uh, but I'm wondering if some of the panelists today can um, can speak to how these lessons might be integrated into um, visits or, or working with the farm that's, that's not of the Shelburne Farms variety. Well, we, we are a working farm. We, we're a small working farm. We're an urban working farm, but we have a farmer on staff. Um, and our participants that come to the farm do work for us <laughs> in the fields through service learning work. Um, and our lessons our, our land. So really the farm and the farming operations is, is adds to the educational programming. Um, we do have gardens on site too as well for the children, but we're a fully operational farm that sells produce. Sorry, Emily, and I shouldn't have phrased it that way. I'm not sure. I know what, what this uh, question is trying to get at, but I'm not sure what the terminology would be to distinguish Shelburne Farms, which clearly is is a working farm, but it's different. Oh, that was Alice who was just speaking. Oh, I'm sorry, Alice. Yeah, that's okay. Sorry, Alice. <laughs> um, 
I think I think it's really hard. I think it's really hard to be a farmer, and I think there's a lot of work and energy that goes into it, and a lot of farmers are not um, necessarily paid a fair wage, especially farm small scale farmers. So I can't imagine being able to be a farmer and an educator um, and do kind of both of those jobs. I think that if a farm can get support through becoming a nonprofit or having another entity partnering with them that can do the educational piece, I think that can be more powerful than trying to farm and trying to teach and take all of that on at once. So I think, you know, if, if it is a farm that wants to do educational work, find a supportive partner that can help with that. You know, one of the things that was really good for us was just letting our kids know who our farmers were that were providing our food for us. We have about 20% of our food that's sourced locally um, in our cafeteria, but just like putting the faces with the names. So if the person that asked the question is actually contributing to a school district, I think it's important that, that, you know, it's not just the name of their farm or their food, but actually the person. I mean, I think that makes a different connection for kids, especially in the middle school. And I, I would like to point out, this is Tom from Montpelier, that the slides that I, sh that I was showing were specific to our school greenhouse and gardens, but that nonprofit that I formed, the, the CSS, and I did allude to this, um, leases land at a local farm, which is a, you know, a production farm, and we do place students in internships and, and um, summer jobs at other area farms. And I have a question now about um, livestock and teaching about animals in, in these equations, I'm, um, which, which I th we definitely saw some pictures of some of your, um, some of your size of students with chickens and whatnot, but I assume all of these, the general concepts that you talked about today would apply with those lessons as well, right? Um, this is Emily. I would say so, definitely um, life cycles, interdependence, um, there's all the big ideas would apply to how humans use animals um, for our own survival. Uh, and I think that um, Shelburne Farms actually has a lot of resources in our project seasons, um, curriculum for activities around um, agricultural and, and animals, um, but yeah, it, it would all apply. Here's a good question. Uh, how are each of your uh, different programs funded? The work that you do specifically with the farm-based education. I can start. This is Tom. Ah. I um I raise I raise all the, the funds pretty much. Um, I'm going to qualify that though. When we initially constructed the greenhouse, uh, all we asked for was permission, and a group of teachers sat down and, and wrote grants. A number of years into it, after we experienced some success, um, we were able to leverage that, and now uh, point two FTE in teacher talk. So one section, one teaching section for me is managing the greenhouse and gardens. Now the CSS, the nonprofit that that I, I created, is, is funded completely from grants, and I write those grants, and that is now paying forty percent of my salary. This is Alice in Portland, and um, um, this is Emily, are... and I can answer that as well. Sorry, go ahead, Alice. Oh, I'll go ahead. Um... Go ahead, Emily. Okay. <laughs> um, at Shelburne Farms, um, we have some for-profit parts of our enterprise that support some of the nonprofit work, like um, our raw milk cheddar production, um, the Inn and Restaurant. Um, but also the Sustainable Schools Project part of the farm is um, grant funded. We independently fundraise for this project. So it's from a variety of sources. Um, and this is Alice. We are, um, not as a nonprofit, we're about 60% um, grant funded and 40% fee-for-service funded. So our fee-for-service um, includes uh, the fee-for-field trips, um, the fee-for-summer camps, um, it includes our big events that we host. We have a development director on, on staff who hosts a couple of big events and does partnerships with local businesses. Um, and then we have um, a number of different grants that we receive. So it's a very small, a couple thousand dollars, up to a hundred thousand um, dollars, depending on the grant. And Emily, what would be a good way for attendees to um, connect with the Farm-Based Education Association to, I, I would assume you probably have something like a newsletter or 
maybe uh, some ways that you let uh, let your members know about grant opportunities? Um, what folks can do is they can visit the Farm-Based Education Association website, which is farmbasededucation.org, and they can join the network there, and then they'll have access to the um, resources and tools that are available on that website. And we do something similar with the National Farm to School Network as well, although our uh, grants might not be quite as tailored to those specific purposes. A lot of it is um, very applicable either way. So I would also suggest joining, uh, doing the same at farmtoschool.org. Could any of the panelists discuss uh, linking um, specific farm-based education experiences with nutrition-related education goals? Yeah, I'll give that a run. Um, part um, of, I can. Uh, let, me, let me just start. I, that we have a program uh, here that we partner with the uh, uh, dietetic and nutrition folks at St. Louis University, and we have them come in and do some specific lessons that are both uh, classroom-based but also hands-on, where they are out in the garden growing and doing that work. So we're able to allow those students and uh, to come in and do some of that work to supplement the things that we're doing here. So it, those partnerships are uh, a possibility too, I think. And I just wanted to add that um, Vermont Feed, which is the food education every day, um, we also have a great website. It's another program that Shelburne Farms is a partner with. And um, Vermont Feed focuses on food farming and nutrition. Um, so we do both. Um, from the cafeteria perspective, the classroom um, perspective, and from the community. So it works on everything from sourcing local foods into the, the school food system to helping teachers um, design curriculum around nutrition and gardening. And that's vtfeed.org. Here's another question. This person says, I'm a farm educator slash farmer and owner and director of a community and education farm. Uh, they're a new organization and a new farm, and they're wondering what, um, what steps they might take as a farm to reach out to schools and, and let schools know that they're there and they're, they're available and they, they want to get involved. Um, I, I could take a stab at, at that. I was waiting to see if anyone had an answer just screaming out. Um, I guess if, if I knew where the person was calling from, that, that could help a little bit. You know, I think maybe that you know the national, some of the national farm to school folks might have a database, and there might be an organization in this person's state they don't know of, which would be like the, the natural uh, liaison. Um, Absolutely. If, you know, if that if that doesn't exist, I would I'd knock on the door. You know. I would, I'd make an appointment with the food service director, the principal, but there's, there's increasingly there's there's more states with national farm or farm school programs, and that's that's what they're trying to do. Absolutely, you, you're right about the national farm school network having um, um, well a network across the country, and I would suggest that you go to farmtoschool.org and look at the map on our homepage and click on your state. We have state leads in all 50 states in the District of Columbia, as well as regional lead agencies. And any of the people involved with those groups can help uh, direct you to some schools that might just be waiting for you to come and, and, and offer your farm up for education. So another question I see phrased here in a couple different forms is about applying the things that you've talked about today uh, to, say, the elementary and even the pre-K set, which it seems like we had several uh, high school examples, but I, I feel like it's, it's probably... Um, uh, there are definitely, definitely the same sort of lessons going on with younger children. Is that correct? Um, this is Emily, yeah. and I can speak to that. Um, definitely, absolutely. In fact, Shelburne Farms right now is working on um, a resource for early childhood educators around um, food farm nutrition and fiber. Um, I still believe that the backwards design, the big idea thing, and the essential question works really well with young children, um, but you might simplify it developmentally for them. So maybe it's what's happening on the farm, where you're looking at cycles, or who lives here. So um, I think that it's all 
especially um, as um, Bob was alluding to earlier, in elementary school, a lot of the content areas are already more integrated and they're already doing projects that call in the different disciplines. So I think the very same activities can be done with younger students, just framed in a more developmentally appropriate way. Yeah, we, we're really excited. We had one of the first programs we started here was with our early childhood center. We have a beautiful set of about a dozen chickens that are over there, uh, and it's a, it's a fantastic program to give all of our kids who sit in an urban setting just really an introduction to what that can look like. Oh, and I just also wanted to add again, on the Sustainable Schools Project website, um, we do have some curricular examples um, that do address um, these topics in the younger grades, so you can download examples of what that curriculum looks like. Uh, we also have that snapshot tool, examples of what that looks like filled out. Um, but there's a lot more resources, kind of K-12, on our website that are available free. You just have to create an account to get access to them. And that's a great segue, Emily, to one of the next questions I was going to relay to you. Um, someone wants to know how you make food garden-based curriculum less uh, intimidating and overwhelming for first-time gardening teachers. And I would suggest that looking through those resources would probably be a great place to start. Is there anything? Yeah, and I think just starting small, doing something that you're comfortable with. Um, in Vermont, Vermont Feed offers courses um, that are available for graduate credit at schools that really help teachers and uh, community members, um, food service staff build basic skills around um, gardening. So you also might want to check with like a local community gardening group um, or if there's a community garden in the area. But it's okay to start small and just learn along with the kids and discover it with them and even be transparent with them about that you're learning too. I think that can be really inspiring and exciting for them. And um, here's a question about, again, about economic sustainability of programs. And, but beyond grants, um, are, are there things that you're doing to develop these programs into, to, to be economically sustainable? Um, I'll take a stab at that. Yeah, there's a, there's a number of there's a number of things, and I didn't fully answer um, that question earlier with regard to Montpelier High School. We sell all of our produce to the the food service um, at a little below wholesale costs, with the idea that the money that they save they then roll back into uh, purchasing more local food from area farmers, and the money we receive from the food service pays for our ongoing costs which is our soil, which we get for half price from Vermont Compost Company because um, we, we send all of our you know, um, food scraps up there and our seeds that we don't save. So our, our ongoing operational costs are pretty much covered by what we're able to sell. The rest of the programming costs and, and the initial capital costs, um, though we did raise through grant funds. I think that's really smart to think about financial sustainability. Um, and I know that our, our nonprofit is 10 years old and we've reduced our grant funding a little bit each year. Um, we will always rely on some grants, but I think the more independent you can be in the, and the idea of um, if you're a nonprofit having a membership program, um, having events that people can donate, um, having options, just being um, just being creative about what you can offer as a nonprofit. Um, we also sell our produce and ask for fees for our programming. Yeah, we're finding ourselves, as I talked about, kind of that part of sustainability before. As we move into that third stage, we're finding more and more restaurants, farmers markets that want our honey, that want our food, that want our eggs from our chickens, want our lettuce from our aquaponics system. So. We're seeing just more and more community partners pop up, and you know every every little, little dollar counts as you're trying to replace things or upgrade things. So we'll take what we can get, but uh, otherwise, yeah, everybody's right. It's grant funded and everything you can scratch together. Well, I'm saying we still have a few questions left here on the board, but we're also at about 15 minutes after the hour, so I think we should wrap up. I'll just let all of our attendees know that if you have a question that didn't get answered today. Uh, please send me an email at chelsea at farm to uh, which is there on your screen, and I will be happy to direct it to our panelists. I know a few people had uh, specific questions for uh, specific panelists or, or questions to do with specific parts of the country. Um, I know that uh, 
there's a wealth of resources out there and we can help direct you to them. Um, like I said, visit the uh, National Farm to School Network's website and visit the website of the Farm-Based Education Association. There are resources there. There will be other resources uploaded as well uh, to the webinar page of our website. Um, there's activity in, in, of this nature going on in all 50 states. Like I said earlier, uh, one of the comments was that they visited their state quite well on our website and, and didn't see as much activity on some of the other states. And that's not necessarily a reflection. There's not a lot of uh, farm to school and farm-based education going on there. It's just that a, a lot of the information on our website is user generated. Um, so people are perhaps too busy in the farm to, um, to send us an email and let us know what's going on. But at any rate, um, we have a lot of folks we can connect you with across the country and I'm happy to do so. But thank you to all of us for joining today and thank you especially to our panelists, um, Alice, Bob, and Leah Tom. Really appreciate your time and this was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Sure.